Welcome to the second episode of Let's Talk About Sects. For our second episode, we found some parallels between the family, the Australian sect we spoke about in episode one, and the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God, which we'll talk about this episode. Crudonia Morwinde, like Anne Hamilton Byrne, was said to be beautiful, captivating and persuasive, and also formed her cult in partnership with an older, respected and religious man. Started in Uganda, the sect's name didn't really roll off the tongue so well, and so I'll limit myself from saying the full name too many times this episode. Crudonia Morwinde, however, was more disturbed than even Anne Hamilton Byrne, and would play a key part in what became one of the deadliest cults in the world. Before we start, a content warning. This podcast deals with subjects that some people may find disturbing, and this episode has some graphic content from around 23 to 31 minutes in, in case you want to skip that part. Content is not suitable for children. A quick note on format. Where I've taken quotes from other sources, I've used voice actors, and that's mainly to give you a break from my voice. The movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God was a sect that looked to go back to the basics of the Bible, and while the cult asked its followers to adhere strictly to the Ten Commandments, its leadership would go on to spectacularly break the Fifth Commandment, Thou shalt not kill. For a few reasons, accurate information is difficult to come by on this group, which was out of the way for reporters, and especially for Western journalists trying to find out what had happened, there were communication issues with the local population due to language interpretation and cultural differences. The authorities were also ill-equipped to handle an investigation of the scale that ended up facing them. For the purpose of this podcast, we're defining a cult as a group, one, dominated by a charismatic leader or leadership that closely controls its members, particularly with regards to their exercising their free will to disengage with the group and its ideology, two, who believes that they exclusively have access to the truth and the rest of the world is wrong, and three, who are largely secretive about the workings of their society to outsiders. Crudonia Mrawinde was born to Paolo Kashaku on July 30, 1952. From a young age, she was exposed to the idea of religious visions, with her father claiming to have seen her sister Evangelista appear before him in 1960. Evangelista told him he would have visions from heaven in the future, but Evangelista had passed away in 1957. A childhood friend of Credonia's, Nalongo Rakanyangira, says that when she was 20, Credonia decided to take revenge on her then-husband, a health inspector named Rubale, who had fallen in love with her sister Perpetua. She is said to have gone on a rampage and burned his belongings. Apparently her family sent her away for treatment after this, though subsequently she would burn a relative's banana plantation, and Cordonia clearly had a liking for fire. Cordonia married five times in total and became a banana beer brewer and bar owner with a reputation for promiscuity, with many reports claiming that she was also a prostitute. Though Cordonia may have encouraged this belief to identify herself with Mary Magdalene, According to a Newsweek investigation, there is also a letter from a family friend that accuses her of robbing and killing a man she had seduced at her bar. 
when the bar, which she owned with her common-law husband Eric Mazima, went bankrupt. Credonia joined a religious group focused on the Virgin Mary. Eric clearly found this a move of convenience, later saying that prior to the business problems, Credonia went to church only once a year, and that Sundays were days of making business. She was after money. The Virgin Mary group could have given Credonia the inspiration to form her own movement, and she soon started having her own visions of the Virgin. When her father, Paolo, heard of her visions, he encouraged her to spread the word across Uganda. Where Paolo wished his daughter to be destined for great things, he would never know that her visions would come to be infamous worldwide, and instead, Credonia would become a key figure in the largest murder investigation that Uganda has ever seen. Joseph Kibwetere was devoutly religious from childhood. Born in 1932, he was educated at the local Catholic school and later came back to teach there. Joseph married his wife Teresa in 1960. She was to bear him 13 children in the coming years, as Joseph climbed the ranks of the Catholic education system, becoming a region supervisor and founding a new private school himself. He also had another three children outside of wedlock. He tried his hand at politics, though he didn't have much luck, and by all accounts had a happy marriage and family life at home. That is, until he crossed paths with Credonia. It was a meeting that would eventually lead to Joseph Kibwetere becoming Uganda's most wanted man. On her travels across the country at the behest of her father, Credonia had heard about the visions of a woman named Blandina Buzigye, who claimed that the Virgin Mary had told her about the impending end of the world and the need to establish a movement of people to return to the Ten Commandments. On June 20, 1989, Credonia was speaking publicly in a cave near where Blandina's visions had occurred about her own visions. Joseph took his wife Teresa to hear her testimony, and Credonia told him that she had instructions from the Virgin that a man named Kibwetere would help her mission. She had chosen her mark well, as the devout Joseph had a fascination with visions and was flattered at the idea of his own importance in her divine quest. Credonia knew that in Ugandan society, male leadership would be crucial for the authority of the movement to be taken seriously. As Joseph's son Juvenar said, his father had status, he had money, and he had a vehicle. Former priest and movement member Paul Ikazire said, The meetings were chaired by Sister Credonia, who was the de facto head of the cult. Kibutere was just a figurehead intended to impose masculine authority over the followers and enhance the cult's public relations. I perceived her as a trickster, obsessed with the desire to grab other people's property. She told her followers to sell their property, but she never sold hers. The movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God had formed, and they were to set up camp on Joseph's family property. The major prediction of the cult that the world would end at the turn of the millennium. Uganda had recently been under the dictatorship of Idi Amin, seeing up to half a million citizens die at the hands of his regime. The AIDS epidemic was on the rise, and many Ugandans were losing faith in the Roman Catholic Church, which was rocked by the repeated scandals dominating headlines. Neighbouring Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, was under the dictatorship of the notoriously corrupt Mobutu. Rwanda was about to launch into the civil war that would see genocide in the coming years. The timing was right for the doomsday cult's rise. Paul Ikazire, the former priest mentioned earlier, said to Uganda newspaper New Vision, We had good intentions. The church was backsliding, 
the priests were covered in scandals and the AIDS scourge was taking its toll on the faithful. The world seemed poised to end. Initially, Joseph's wife Teresa and their children joined in the movement's activities, and Teresa bought clothes for Credonia and her friend Angela, as they were very poor. But after a while, Credonia appeared to have turned on Teresa, possibly due to a romantic interest in Joseph. As more and more orders from the Virgin started to involve punishments and keeping food from the family, the eldest son, Juvena Wagambwa, started to protest. With the group's members swelling, 60 children were now being forced to sleep on the ground of a 15 by 40 foot shed, many contracting the skin condition scabies. One of Joseph and Teresa's daughters, Edith, claims that at one point Credonia said that the Virgin Mary had appeared to her and instructed her that a sacrifice was needed and that all children under the age of five had to be killed, though there's no evidence that this instruction was carried out in the end. Juvenar brought his mother and siblings around to his perspective when Credonia started burning Teresa's clothes and Joseph started selling off the family property to fund the movement and the group was finally evicted from the estate. Joseph left his family and separated from his wife in 1992. A visit for the death of one of his sons in 1995 was the only time they would ever see him again. Initial movement members were family and friends of the founders, who then invited their extended family and friends. Another priest, Dominic Catarababo, had joined in 1990. He had a master's degree from California and his religious and academic credibility encouraged more to join. Recognising his value, Credonia and Joseph promoted Dominic to a leadership position, with Credonia now referred to as the programmer, directing most group actions via her visions, Joseph taking on the role of chief prophet, which some claimed was more of a figurehead role, and Dominic becoming a bishop, leading sermons and religious rituals. Others, mostly consisting of relatives of Credonia, formed the rest of the Twelve Strong Leadership, the numbers made to reflect the Twelve Apostles. Joseph had by now been excommunicated by his beloved Catholic Church, and Dominic was also excommunicated in 1992. The movement asked all recruits to sell their belongings in order to fund the community, which eventually settled in the Kanungu district on Credonia's father's land, about 360 kilometres or 217 miles, southwest of Uganda's capital Kampala. All three of Credonia's brothers are said to have died suspiciously of poisoning prior to this, leaving Credonia as the sole heir to her father's land. The movement members built a small township with a church and a school, though the school was eventually shut down by the authorities for its lack of sanitation and educational standards. Branches of the movement also formed in four other areas around the southwest of the country. Members who sold all of their belongings and passed on the proceeds to the movement found themselves reliant upon the group for everything, as if they were to leave, they would be destitute. As suggested by its name, the Movement for the Restoration of the Ten Commandments of God saw the Bible's Ten Commandments as the main focus of their belief system. In fact, they adhered to the commandments so closely that they encouraged members to remain completely silent. Conveniently, this helped the sect maintain its secrecy and the leadership's control over its members as well. They told members that they should communicate only via sign language and writing, so that they would not fall foul of the Eighth Commandment of bearing false witness. The leadership recruited members from all classes, and though some reports say that they preyed upon the poor, there was a wide variety of classes in their makeup. Leaders held up the AIDS epidemic as proof that God was punishing those who were not adhering to the commandments closely enough and the message resonated, with police, business people and graduates turning to the sect. Those who had the disease were told that they would be cured if they joined the group and repented their sins. 
They said that they welcomed people of all religions, as theirs was not a new religion at all, but a movement that served to let people know that it was the neglect of the Ten Commandments that was causing the world's woes. Though the leaders still managed to enjoy lavish meals, movement members fasted two days a week on Mondays and Fridays, with only a light supper eaten, and had a very basic two meals on other days. They were not allowed to have intercourse, even if they were married, and those who were caught doing so were caned severely. Soap was banned, and children were separated from their parents, as well as males from females for sleeping, except for Credonia and Joseph, who some say had a sexual relationship. Followers worked very hard in the fields to produce crops for the community and its two stores, except on Sundays. Life for movement members was said to be similar to a labour camp. They also gave up their clothing for coloured robes and slept without mattresses. The hardship was positioned as paving their way to heaven, while it also kept members in a constant state of exhaustion and, as a result, more pliable. Although life was very tough for them, most believed that they were the luckiest people in the world, as they were the chosen ones who would inherit the earth after God's apocalypse, when everything would be theirs and they would have a direct line to Jesus. Anything that came into the settlement from the outside world had to be exercised with holy water and prayers, with Credonia saying that she sometimes burned things that had gone to the devil, though in reality only things she didn't have a use for were likely to be burned. She and the other leaders created a sense of deep fear of the devil infiltrating the movement at any moment. Katerina Nansana, an ex-member who was 72 when she spoke to Newsweek in August 2000, said, I believed it would save me. I had sores on my feet, my arms and my legs, but I didn't care. I believed what I was doing was right. It was very difficult to desert the group, due to both internal pressure and the fact that members had sold all of their belongings. But by February 1994, former priest Paul Ikazire had become disillusioned with the way that the leadership was misinterpreting quotes from the Bible to further their aims, and he left, taking 70 followers with him. Credonia told remaining members that Paul was a devil and would only live for another two years. There are various stories of harassment of deserters, and those struggling to start their lives again post-membership were told that they were being punished by the Lord, a threat which also served to keep the remaining members in line. By the mid-90s, the movement was attempting to register as a religious NGO, but the then-resident district commissioner refused to support the application. In 1996, Dominic and the leaders put out a booklet called A Timely Message from Heaven, The End of the Present Times, which members were told they should read repeatedly. An excerpt says, The Lord told me that hurricanes of fire would rain forth from heaven and spread over those who would not have repented. This fire will also reach inside the buildings. There is no way one can escape. By 1997, the movement claimed to have 5,000 members though outside estimates range from one to 4,000, and the new resident district commissioner had been persuaded to approve their registration as an NGO. Two movement nuns were known to attend the assistant resident district commissioner's house to carry out domestic chores, according to a parliamentary report that was leaked in July 2014. It was 1998 that the school was shut down for unsanitary conditions and lack of educational standards, though it continued to receive education funding from the government right up until March of 2000. In 1999, Joseph was being treated at the Butabika Psychiatric Hospital in Kampala for manic depression, with the head psychiatrist there stating that he presented classic symptoms of psychotic illness. Were the movement's activities getting to him? Had his mental illness existed before he met Credonia, forming another avenue through which she could exert her influence? Unfortunately, Joseph stopped attending his sessions that year, when the date of the doomsday prediction was growing near.
Credonia continued to say that she was being visited by visions of the Virgin Mary, who talked to her through inanimate objects and whose messages the leaders used to instruct followers. By the turn of the millennium, the movement's twelve apostles had dwindled to eight due to defections. Something had to be done to keep the rest of the followers in line. There is some contention over the events of the year 2000. Many media reports say that the movement's leadership told everyone that they needed to prepare for the end of the world, which was coming at midnight on December 31, 1999, and that followers sold any of their remaining belongings in anticipation as the prophesied date finally arrived. But at the turn of the millennium, the world didn't end. A common theory is that after the fateful day turned out to be not so fateful, followers of the cult became disgruntled with their leaders and started demanding the return of their money and belongings. A different theory is that Joseph Kipwetere had actually already died, and though he may have been only a puppet as far as Credonia was concerned, she had created him as a leader to be worshipped, and he was an effective figurehead for the movement members. They may have been disgruntled at not knowing where he was and at not having had his guidance for many months. Whatever the reason for their questions, those followers asking them were disappearing. Apparently, the Virgin Mary then appeared once more and told the movement, via Credonia, of course, that the world was really due to end and that she would deliver a special message between March 16th and March 18th. In the lead-up to this doomsday, the movement's 60 head of cattle were sold off for less than a third of what they were worth. The group's stores had also been selling off items cheaply. Members were bussed into Kanungu from other movement branches. Many tried to convince ex-members and even friends and family who were non-members to come and hear the Virgin Mary's special message, or even just to come for a party. On March 16, they feasted on chicken, bread, a cow that they had slaughtered, and 70 crates of soda. Local officials had been invited to a gathering on the next day, a farewell for the assistant resident district commissioner who had been so good to them, and a reception for the new one, possibly to make sure they had no reason to visit the community in the days prior. In the early hours of daylight, on March 17, Credonia was reported to have boarded a local bus departing for Kampala to check that none of her members were leaving the area. Studying the faces of travellers and finding none she recognised, Credonia wished those on board a safe journey as she disembarked. Somewhere between 300 and 600 movement members, consisting mainly of women and children, had been praying all night. They had burned their few remaining belongings and had shaved their heads as instructed. They were led to the church, known as the Ark, after Noah's Ark, and the windows and doors were nailed shut. They were sprayed with holy water and jerry cans lined the walls of the church. What was in the holy water and the jerry cans is suspected to be some kind of accelerant, as the church was soon consumed along with all of its inhabitants, in a blaze so hot that it would be difficult to identify how many were killed, as skulls were said to have exploded and disintegrated with the intensity, and Uganda didn't have DNA testing capabilities at the time. Initially, the authorities investigated the fire as a mass suicide, but soon they indicated that they were treating the incident as mass murder, as the leaders had never spoken about suicide in their messages about the end of the world. The 1996 leaflet put out by the movement spoke about fire raining down from heaven that would come inside buildings, so the membership may have been set up to believe this is what was occurring while they were inside the church. Uganda's president, Yuweri Museveni, said that the deaths were, quote, 
mass murder by these priests for monetary gain. And while some members did understand that they were not going to return from the compound that day, police spokesman Asaman Mugenyi told the New York Times, Although they understood that they were going to heaven, they did not know that they would be murdered. One woman lost 11 members of her family, including her mother and brother, whose remains have never been identified, but who left for Kanungu four days before the inferno and never came back. The brother, Ellie, left a note which included the words, I have hardly remained with over ten days here before I join all the other members of the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God before the closure of the Ark. That will mean, therefore, that we shall never meet once again. To me it sounds sad, but that is what it must be. As we follow directives from heaven, we are supposed to gather in the selected area before the wrath of the Almighty God the Creator is let down onto non-repentance. Stephen Mutaremwa lost his mother, who had joined in the hopes of curing her suspected AIDS, and five siblings. He had left the cult after arguing with his mother about wanting to continue attending school, which she had pulled him out of to join. Jakob Timanyandera lost his wife, three daughters, and 16 grandchildren in the blaze. He had argued with his wife for years about his family's involvement in the movement and asked her not to go, but she couldn't be stopped. Augustine Ruamutwe's wife, Olive, though they had separated, nevertheless convinced him to join the movement in the 90s. He later defected. Some of his children had stopped him from selling his property, so he had somewhere to come back to, though he was harassed by various cult members who camped on his property in 1998 and had to be chased out. A few days before the fire, Olive came to visit Augustine and convinced him to attend a party at Kanungu on March 17. Augustine, Olive and seven of their children haven't been seen since and all are presumed to have perished in the inferno. They were survived by a daughter and two sons who lived in Kampala and hadn't joined the movement. Unfortunately, this was just the start of revelations to come about the sinister activities and true nature of the cult. Dominic Catarababo had purchased 13 gallons of sulfuric acid on March 15, telling the shop owner that he had a problem with some batteries at a remote seminary, and at first investigators were looking into whether the acid was used in the blaze. However, on March 24, six bodies were discovered at the cult's Buhunga compound, immersed in sulfuric acid. Over the following weeks, mass graves were discovered at four cult properties, with 153 bodies found at the Bohunga compound. 155 bodies were uncovered at the estate of Dominic Katarababo, which he had sold off to his nephew on March 11. 72 were the remains of children, 59 were women, 22 were men, and two were unknown. By the time all the bodies were dug up, with the victims of the church fire, there were a total of 979 counted, more than the 914 of the Jonestown People's Temple Massacre of 1978. And while later figures decreased the number estimated to have been in the church fire, there were almost certainly more graves that were never discovered. National Police spokesman Asaman Mugenyi told Newsweek in August 2000, There are many more graves. We know that. We tried, but there isn't much interest and there is no money. Some reports estimate the total deaths in the thousands. Most of those found in the mass graves had been poisoned, though some had been strangled and some had been hit in the head. Police say that those who took too long to die from the poison, which they were given via contaminated food, were the ones whose deaths were hastened by other means. It's said that the victims had dug the trenches themselves, being told that they were digging latrines when they were really digging their own graves. 
Later analysis showed that the hundreds who had been killed before the fire had died in the four to six weeks prior. The six original bodies that had been immersed in acid were likely the men who did most of the work burying the rest. With local authorities short on manpower for the scale of excavation required of the various mass graves, in a move that was later deemed a human rights violation, they called on nearby prisons to provide prisoner labour. Prisoners later complained of inadequate gloves being provided, as some were given clinical gloves that tore, and of having to work without shirts, so coming into direct skin contact with the decomposing remains that they were exhuming. Some complained of nightmares following the awful job, and one prisoner reported still occasionally vomiting when the Ugandan Human Rights Commission team visited two years later to talk to the prisoners involved. There was intense international media scrutiny at the time, and condemnation of their use of prisoner labour may also have contributed to authorities ceasing to search for more mass graves at movement properties. How could so many people have died without any local authorities noticing? Following the fire, the Kanungu Assistant Resident District Commissioner was arrested on suspicion of preventing investigations into the sect, and there's evidence that there were other ties with local officials that kept prying eyes away, with reports of livestock and cash gifts being offered in bribery. There had been various warnings before the massacre that had gone unheeded. On March 6, 1998, the Ugandan Human Rights Commission had received a letter from a nurse who wanted them to investigate possible human rights abuses against her mother, who had passed away under mysterious circumstances in the cult, and her late brother's children, who had been taken there by their mother and were living under harsh conditions without a proper education. She found their response highly unsatisfactory, as it only addressed how she could take on administration of her late brother's estate, and she gave up on the matter two years before she lost her sister-in-law and five of her brother's six children in the fire. In January of 2000, a man wrote a letter to Senior Assistant Commissioner of Police John Okumu that Joseph Kibutere had been kidnapping children into his illegal cult and that some were buried in a mass grave. John Okumu wrote to the District Police Commissioner on January 25, who responded on February 5 and copying the Resident District Commissioner and Local Council 5, being the district's local council, by writing that the group was in fact an NGO and not an illegal cult, and that some children had been known to voluntarily join, albeit without their parents' approval, but that it was untrue that there were any deaths or mass graves. This was just over a month before the disaster, a period during which there were indeed children being buried in mass graves prior to the fire. While the sect leadership was thought to have perished in the fire at first, Witnesses put forth the possibility that Credonia, Dominic and Joseph may not have been in attendance at the church. Ponzianu Nuamanya, who claimed to have been in the church that day but escaped the fire as he went out to buy some cakes for the children, told the Monitor that Credonia and another of the leaders had left the camp earlier in the day. They told us that they were going to prepare another branch for similar prayers. And that Dominic had already left that morning ahead of the others. And as mentioned earlier, Joseph may have already died by this point, though a headline in Uganda's New Vision publication on March 17, 2012, on the 12-year anniversary of the fire, says that he remains Uganda's most wanted man. The government maintained that Ugandan police were continuing to work closely with Interpol to track him and his accomplices down, and there have been reported sightings of Dominic in Rwanda and Kenya, and of Credonia in a Ugandan village, but they could not be verified by the police. Although six arrest warrants were issued for leaders who may or may not have perished in the fire, 
the only arrest ever made was the former Assistant Resident District Commissioner, Reverend Richard Mutazindwa, who was held in custody for a month. Richard then had to report to police regularly for the year-and-a-half-long investigation that followed, after which he was told that he was a free man. Although he was never charged with anything, he has been unable to find suitable works since his name became so closely associated with the incidents. Joseph Kibwateri's eldest son, Juvenar, had few qualms about who should be held responsible for the deaths. He said to a reporter from the New York Times in the months following the church fire, I feel pity for those people who died. In fact, I hate my father. If he has escaped and I meet him, I wouldn't hesitate killing him. However guilty the other leaders of the movement were, and though plenty refer to the movement as the Kibwateri cult, it does seem that Credonia Merwinde's regularly noted lead role in the creation and downfall of the sect may have fallen victim to the patriarchal histories that often prefer to be told. Sixteen years after the tragedy, the government investigation set up in its aftermath is still yet to make any report. The commission of eminent Ugandans that had been appointed by the Internal Affairs Minister had never sat, with those appointed saying they were never called to any meetings, and the 2014 Parliamentary Committee report that resulted from a petition by orphans of the victims failed to find a record of any work done by the commission. On October 29, 2016, Uganda's Prime Minister Ruhukana Rugunda said, Let us not take things for granted. What happened 16 years ago can still happen today. Let us still play our role of coming together for worship, but look at each other. Be vigilant so that masqueraders like Kibwateri are exposed. Today we'll finish with a quote from the foreword of the Ugandan Human Rights Commission's report into the massacre. From Chairperson Margaret Sakagya. The philosophy behind freedom of religion has been the rationality of human beings and their ability to be masters of their own destiny. Human beings are believed to be endowed with a special quality to think and reason therefore having the ability to decide how they want to worship in accordance with each one's conscience. It is this conscience that inform how, when, why one relates to the supernatural arena. In all this, the human being is expected to know and be mindful of the boundary of this freedom, where it begins to violate another person's rights. It was with shock that the world woke up to the events of 17 March 2000, when more than 500 members of a locally based cult, the Movement for the Restoration of the Ten Commandments, perished in an inferno in Kanungu, southwestern Uganda. The equally shocking developments that subsequently unfolded confirmed that the freedom of worship had been taken for granted. We hope this report provides information and lessons that will be found very useful by all of those interested, particularly human rights advocates and researchers, and that it will help illuminate and transform the context in which freedom of worship has hitherto been regarded in this country. If you've been personally affected by involvement in a cult, or would like to support those who have been, you can find support or donate to Cult Information and Family Support if you're in Australia via www.cifs.org.au, and you can find resources outside of Australia with the International Cultic Studies Association via www.icsahome.com and the Freedom of Mind Resource Centre via freedomofmind.com. 
Let's Talk About Sex is researched and presented by me, Sarah Steele. Sound design and music is by Joe Gould. Voice work by Christian Lee, Joe Gould and Zoe Lyon. All information sources are listed on our website at ltaspod.com.